Jupiter may be the biggest planet in the solar system, but its days are numbered. Because today, we're using Earth's biggest, baddest bombs to blow the gas giant into oblivion. How many nukes would you need to do the job? What obstacles would these rocket-bound bombs encounter on the way? And would one nuclear explosion ignite the entire planet? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we nuked Jupiter. Nuclear weapons are so powerful that even the low-yield versions, like those dropped on Japan by the United States in World War II, have the explosive equivalent of 15 to 20 kilotons of dynamite each. What makes them so volatile is that they harness the intense energy-releasing power of nuclear fission or fusion. These are the same processes that happen in our very own sun. So be careful when moving these things out to Jupiter. One false move and you could be incinerated by a fireball as hot as the center of the sun. In order to blow Jupiter to bits, one single bomb wouldn't necessarily be up for the task. Good thing for this scenario that there are a lot of nuclear weapons on Earth. Maybe the safest plan would be getting them all off our planet anyway. Given the top secret nature of military activities, it's hard to know the exact number, but estimates put the global arsenal at about 12,700 with the United States and Russia battling for top spot with 5,500 to 6,000 weapons each. Okay, there's no use in delaying. Let's get these rockets off Earth as fast as possible. The distance between Earth and Jupiter fluctuates from about 590 million to 970 million kilometers. In the past, missions like the Galileo space probe took nearly five years to make the journey to the gas giant. But our rockets wouldn't take this long. Galileo had to be slow enough to enter Jupiter's orbit. We just need to hit the planet head on, so you'd only be looking at about 550 to 650 days to get the job done. You shouldn't be too reckless and speedy, though. You don't want to nuke something else by accident. Now, bypassing the Moon and Mars would be easy enough, but getting safely through the asteroid belt would be like navigating a minefield. There are millions of asteroids riddled between Mars and Jupiter, and while the average distance between them is a not-so-worrisome 966,000 kilometers, sometimes it can still get a little cramped in there. And Jupiter is partly to blame for this. The planet's massive gravitational influence causes many of these to group into clusters known as families, carelessly navigate through one like the Flora family, and you'd better hope none of our rockets would collide with any of its 400 asteroids. For the best chance of success, you should aim to transport your rockets through the Kirkwood gaps. These are nearly asteroid-free regions in the belt because you'd hate to see all of our planet's nukes detonate themselves in a blinding chain reaction before reaching our target. As the first of our bombs exploded on Jupiter, you'd see bright flashes back here on Earth. Just like when the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet slammed into Jupiter in 1994. But that only released 5% as much energy as the Tsar Bomba, the largest bomb ever created. So, with thousands of our nuclear bombs, Jupiter's days would have to be numbered, right? Well, not exactly. Even though our nukes could produce an explosion hotter than the sun, this wouldn't cause all the hydrogen on Jupiter to ignite. It just isn't dense enough to sustain nuclear fusion. And even if every bomb was detonated, Jupiter wouldn't blow up completely either. In order to do that, we'd need to unleash as much energy as the sun releases over 160 years, all at once. And for that highly energetic result, 
about one billion billion nukes would be required. Somewhat more than the 12,700 in our arsenal. To build that many bombs, you'd need a combined mass of material that would almost be twice that of the largest moon in the solar system, Jupiter's Ganymede. No small feat, since it's bigger than Pluto and Mercury. Humanity's nuclear arsenal is capable of destroying all life on Earth over and over and over. Maybe it's time we dumped it far away. Now, we might want to inhabit other planets in the future, so how about yeah, our closest star? How many nukes could we throw at the sun? What would be the price tag for this mission? And could we accidentally destroy our only source of daylight? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we nuked the sun. The sun is mainly made of hydrogen and helium. The temperatures and pressures at its center are extremely high. So high that the hydrogen atoms fuse together and become helium. That process releases enormous amounts of energy that powers the sun. It's known as fusion. And you know what else uses fusion to power up? Yeah, that's right. Most modern nuclear weapons get their destructive energy from fusing hydrogen isotopes. This is why they're often called hydrogen bombs or fusion bombs. Around five billion years from now, the sun will run out of hydrogen and die. A dead sun is terrible news for Earth because we will die along with the star. Now, if humans managed to stick around for that long, we would be scrambling for ways to keep the sun fueled and running. And if we were also still interested in getting rid of our destructive hydrogen fusion bombs, could we nuke the sun and power it back to life? Well, first things first, we would need to gather each and every single nuke on the planet. This wouldn't be easy since the nine countries that are known to possess nukes are extremely suspicious of each other. But if the other option is the guaranteed death of our only son, eh, they could be willing to give up their weapons of mass destruction for the cause. Take my gun from me. How big is humanity's arsenal, you might ask? Well, at least 13,000 nuclear bombs big each of them with the explosive power of at least 100 kilotons of dynamite. The United States alone is estimated to have 650 bombs that are 60 times more powerful than the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki during World War II. If you were overseeing this explosive operation, you would need to be extremely careful. After all, you definitely wouldn't want to have a surprise detonation. If every one of these fusion bombs went off, the explosion would lead to so much debris being injected into the atmosphere that it would trigger a nuclear winter. That's because sunlight would be unable to reach the Earth's surface. Cue the worldwide below freezing temperatures, ecosystems collapsing, and nuclear fallout. This accident would devastate all living beings, humans and animals alike. In trying to save the sun, humanity could block itself from all of its warm rays. Ironic, isn't it? So yeah, you'd need to handle with care. You'd also have to sharpen your fundraising skills. If a modern nuke has a mass close to the one dropped on Nagasaki, Sending it to space would cost around $170 billion. And that's just for one bomb out of the 13,000. It's fair to say the whole world economy would need to bend and break in order to subsidize the survival of the sun and humanity. 
even if you did come up with the cash, there are far hotter challenges ahead. Like, how do you build a spaceship that doesn't melt as it approaches the sun? The closest a spacecraft has come to our star is eight and a half million kilometers. Even at that distance, it still had to endure temperatures of 1,377 degrees Celsius. Only thanks to a thermal shield made up of carbon composite material was it able to withstand the scorching heat. However we send our hydrogen bombs into space, it will have to incorporate a much improved version of this protection system. So add that to the bill. And there would still be a mountain of remaining technical obstacles, like finding the safest location to launch the nukes into space, or developing the technology that will allow us to monitor and control them from such a massive distance. But let's say you managed to do it. All our nukes are in orbit and within launching distance to the sun. This is it. You send the order to fire all the hydrogen bombs into our hydrogen-fueled star. Now, you wait to see how it begins to recharge. Just a little longer. A little longer. And nothing seems to happen. The anchor of our solar system continues to die. But how? Well, as colossal as the power of our 13,000 nukes might seem, this punch is nothing compared to what the sun is packing. Right now, our star emits over 70 million times more energy per second than all of our nuclear weapons combined. Even if it were running out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, throwing our hydrogen bombs at it to feed it would be like throwing a box of matches into a forest fire. You'd barely make a dent in the blaze. Yeah, that's a bummer, but at least you didn't destroy what little remains of our decaying sun. If that was your intent, you'd need something with a lot more firepower. Meet the antimatter bomb. When the Big Bang created the universe, it did so with an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Matter is what you, the Earth, the Sun, and most things are made of. Antimatter, on the other hand, is composed of subatomic particles with properties opposite to those of normal matter. Put a little simpler, it's the inverse of matter. When a particle of matter collides with an antiparticle of antimatter, they annihilate each other in a flash of energy. If enough of those two camps came in contact with each other, it would lead to a massive explosion, also known as an antimatter bomb. But here's the catch. Antimatter is incredibly rare. If you pulled together all the antimatter on the planet, you'd end up with only around 20 nanograms. A single nanogram is only one billionth of a gram. That is so little that even if it were combined with matter, you wouldn't even have enough energy to boil a cup of tea. Now, you could produce more antimatter, but that would cost you at least $2.7 quadrillion dollars for just one gram. And remember, we're here to save the sun, not destroy it. Today, we're dropping a big bomb into the deepest part of the ocean. So grab a surfboard and get ready to hang 10 on the waves of a massive nuclear tsunami. How would you deliver a nuke to the bottom of the Mariana Trench? What would this underwater explosion be like? And what kind of destruction would it cause? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we nuked the Mariana Trench. Welcome to the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. 
The Mariana Trench is located in the Western Pacific Ocean, just 360 kilometers away from the island of Guam. You'll be traveling down 11 kilometers to Challenger Deep, the deepest point of the trench. Here, you could stack about 30 Empire State Buildings on top of each other before hitting the surface. You'd be among the brave few to venture into these high-pressure, pitch-black, and near-freezing waters. Joining the company of scientists, a naval officer, and even filmmaker James Cameron. But you'll be carrying the most precious cargo of all. The biggest nuclear bomb ever made. Okay, wait, before you worry about what would happen if you exploded a bomb at the bottom of the trench? You'd want to figure out how to get it there safely. If a bomb accidentally exploded near the surface, it could be dangerous for many people. You could think of it as a massive nuclear tsunami. Waves hundreds of meters high spreading out in all directions. This could create a hazardous situation for the islands neighboring the Mariana Trench, like Guam, Japan, or the Philippines. Luckily, these waves would behave differently than your regular tsunami waves. They would break earlier. That means they'd be smaller and less catastrophic when they reached land. But still, Better to avoid this crisis and get that bomb safely down into the trench. To do this, you'd have to protect it from extremely high pressures. At the bottom of the trench, the pressure is so high it would be like having 100 adult elephants on your head. You'd want to use a special pressure vessel to transport the bomb, just like Operation Wigwam. In 1955, the United States detonated a bomb at a depth of 600 meters. It was twice as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The explosion generated a massive bubble across the water, and deadly radioactive contamination spread across 13 square kilometers. But your bomb would be the largest nuke ever created more like the Tsar Bomba. This nuclear weapon was over 3,000 times more powerful than Little Boy, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki. And you'd have to take it much, much deeper than the wigwam test. At the moment of detonation, a bubble of hot steam would expand rapidly. In just a few seconds, it would cover an area of about one kilometer. On the surface, you'd see a massive bulge in the water. But it wouldn't reach great heights. That's because you would detonate the bomb so deep that the water pressure above would cause the bubble to collapse. But within a few seconds, that bubble would shrink, then start to expand outward again. This expansion and contraction would continue for three or four cycles. This would leave the water turbulent, hot, and mixed with radioactive debris. At least no neighboring coastal cities would have to worry about being wiped out by a tsunami. But you certainly wouldn't see the effects ending there. The increased temperatures from the explosion could create intense hurricanes. And the turbulent waters and radioactive material would have adverse effects on marine life. There would be mass casualties from the explosion, and deep sea fish could be blinded by the bright flash of light. Over time, you could see unexpected or surprising effects on the ecosystem near the detonation site. There are corals as big as cars after the 23 detonations at the U.S. nuclear testing site on Bikini Atoll, not to mention an abundance of aquatic animal life.
One day, Mars could look like this. Allowing humans to comfortably live on the planet. All we'd need to do is to terraform it. But how? Well, we could nuke it. Would dropping nukes on Mars make it easier to live there? This is what if. And here's what would happen if we nuked Mars. Believe it or not, this is something scientists have considered for decades. Elon Musk of SpaceX seems to think that nuking Mars might be one of the best and quickest options to make it a place where humans could live. The idea is that we would explode thermonuclear bombs in the sky over the planet's two poles. This would heat up the ice caps and release carbon dioxide and water from the poles. Then the greenhouse effect would take place. It would heat up the whole planet, making the surface more habitable. So this all sounds super quick and easy. Why haven't we done this yet? It's because there's a high chance that nuking Mars might not work out the way we want it to. There are many things that could go wrong with this plan. The first problem is it's all just theory and the theory could be wrong. That's because Mars has been losing its atmosphere for a long time. Earth's atmosphere is almost 100 times thicker than Mars's and if we're going to live on Mars, it needs a thicker atmosphere. Some scientists think that we could release CO2 from the North and South Poles, and this could make Mars' atmosphere more like Earth's. But a 2018 study published in Nature Astronomy found that even if the nukes are successful, it would only increase Mars' atmosphere to 7% of what Earth has. Even if we create more carbon dioxide in Mars' atmosphere, it still wouldn't be nearly enough to heat the planet. And the planet could seriously use more heat since its current temperature averages around minus 63 degrees. And it would take decades for the red planet to warm up, even after it gained the extra CO2. So, in theory, this could delay humans from ever landing on Mars. Not only that, but this assumes that dropping thermonuclear bombs on the planet would go perfectly. Keep in mind, these are nukes. You know, the things that can destroy entire cities. In fact, the bombs we'd use on Mars would be 1,000 times stronger than the ones used in World War II. If a bomb exploded on the planet's surface instead of up in the atmosphere, some severe damage would occur. Not only would it completely destroy parts of the planet's surface, it would also cause even more radiation. Another thing that would delay us from ever settling on Mars. It's also very likely that instead of warming Mars, a bomb could cause a nuclear winter. This could happen from the dust and particles in the atmosphere caused by nuclear explosions. They'd almost entirely block out the sun, causing Mars to cool down even more. So, nuking Mars probably isn't the best idea. And maybe we should get some humans on the planet in its natural state before we start trying to change it. Doomsday is here! A nuclear bomb has just unleashed hell right in front of your eyes. The land turns to ash and scatters in the wind in just moments. You have mere seconds to get to safety. But once that blast hits, how could the light burn your skin? Why should you never look at the explosion? And how can taking off your clothes save your life? This is What If, and here's what would happen if a nuke exploded near you. Once that missile launches, you can't escape what's coming next, but what are you facing? Well, four types of energy are about to be unleashed. First, a blast wave would rip through the landscape, knocking you around like a rag doll and destroying buildings. After that, brace yourself for intense light, followed by skin-melting heat and deadly radiation. Then. A hot bubble of gas will form a fireball that will vaporize everything inside it. All that dust debris will shoot up into the air, creating the iconic mushroom cloud. Even if you somehow survived this nightmare, why would your life never be the same again? 
So far, only one nation has used a nuclear bomb against its enemy. The first of the two bombs dropped on Japan by the United States during World War II, Little Boy decimated Hiroshima. It had the strength of 15 kilotons of TNT. But that's nothing compared to what nuclear weapons are packing today. The most powerful is 80 times stronger than what hit Hiroshima. Now, while that would be devastating and level everything for miles, it wouldn't make our planet a nuclear wasteland. You, on the other hand, well, you wouldn't be so lucky. If you happen to be in the blast vicinity, your days would be numbered. Remember that intense bright light? Yeah, well, that flash is strong enough to burn your skin off. These intense flash burns can be fatal, and they killed 50% of the people who died in Japan. And here's hoping you didn't stare directly into that blast because this devastating light would oversaturate your retinal pigments and leave you blind. Flash blindness can go away after two minutes if the explosion happens during the day, but at night, you could be blinded for much longer. And if you weren't sheltered, you may not survive what's coming next. In just a fraction of a second, the nuclear fireball would expand out like a balloon rising into the sky. The heat from that fireball would send out a blast wave that would rip you and the ground under you apart. If you didn't make it indoors before the blast, the supersonic wave might kill you by ripping off your skin or sending you flying through the air. Then, a violent burst of thermal radiation would be released and head right toward you. And unfortunately for you, it's only going to get worse. Next, a second pulse would hit, lasting a few seconds this time. This wave would carry 99% of the total thermal radiation from the nuke. You could be 8 kilometers away and still suffer first-degree burns from this detonation. And all that would happen in a matter of moments. Then, the resulting mushroom cloud would tower above everything. So, what would you do now? Well, even if you only suffered third-degree burns, the pain would be enough to send your body into instant shock. Hospitals, if there were any left in the area, would be so overrun with other victims that you might not get treated for hours. Gamma and neutron radiation would cover everything the first minute after the blast. If you somehow lived through that blast wave and the fiery heat, this radiation might kill you. As the dust settles, the radioactive particles would penetrate everything, making the blast site hazardous for months, if not years. Radiation exposure could lead to brain seizures and cancer. It might even reduce the lymphocyte cells in your blood. That would increase your risk for infections. To avoid that lethal fallout, you'd have to run and hide. You'd have about 10 minutes before the radiation hits, so hustle and get to a concrete or brick building to shelter you for the next 24 hours. And you're gonna want to get naked. If you take off your radiated clothes, you could remove up to 90% of the radioactive material clinging to you, so save your modesty for another time. Now, since you've stripped down, wash yourself with soap and water to get rid of any remaining radioactive particles. Now, there probably wouldn't be any power left, but you'd have to keep the air conditioning and the fans off if there was. Otherwise, contaminated air from the outside could come in. An asteroid races toward Earth. It's big, it's fast, and it's about to do a lot of damage. But we're not just going to sit around and wait for the end of days. We're going to fight back. What would happen if we nuked an asteroid? 
would it save humanity or make things worse? How does a nuclear blast in space compare to a blast on Earth? And would our nukes even be strong enough to destroy it? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we nuked an asteroid. In the year 2175, the asteroid Bennu will pass by Earth, and there's a 1 in 2700 chance that it will hit us. If those sound like good odds to you, think again. Bennu is taller than the Empire State Building, and it's 15 times heavier than the Great Pyramid of Giza. And if it hit the Earth, it would release as much energy as 23 Tsar Bombas, which is the largest hydrogen bomb ever exploded. Do you still like those odds? I'd like them a little more if we had a contingency plan. For NASA, that's the Hypervelocity Asteroid Mitigation Mission for Emergency Response, also known as HAMMER. And just like its name suggests, the plan is to ram into an incoming asteroid or to detonate a nuke that will send it off course. But will it be enough? And what sort of repercussions could we expect? The sooner we discover an asteroid heading our way, the safer we'll be. For example, if we detected an incoming asteroid a year in advance, we'd only have to change its course by a few centimeters to keep it from hitting Earth. To do this, we could detonate a nuclear bomb a few hundred meters away from the asteroid, causing it to change its course and move away from Earth. And if that didn't work, we could just crash into the asteroid with the most powerful bomb we've got. But if anything were to malfunction before the bomb reached the asteroid, the resulting consequences might even be worse than the asteroid hitting Earth. But once the nuke was in space, the world's population would be relatively safe. With no atmosphere out there, only vacuum, the blast would disappear completely but the radiation would be much stronger. While people on Earth would be safe, anyone in any nearby spaceships would be risking their lives. In the interest of preventing as many casualties as possible, this would have to be an automated mission. And assuming that nothing goes wrong and there isn't some kind of AI mutiny, we could very well succeed in pushing an asteroid off course as long as it wasn't too big. A bigger asteroid would require bolder tactics, such as DART. DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. NASA plans to slam into an asteroid in 2022 to change its orbit. The impact would be equal to three tons of TNT. This mission could result in the first ever man-made meteorite shower. And if it works, it will serve as a blueprint of how we could respond to asteroid threats in the future. Of course, when it comes to destroying Bennu, the bomb we'll use will be at least a million times stronger than what DART will be packing. And yes, we've got nukes that are that powerful. The only thing we'd have to look out for, after blowing up a giant asteroid, is space debris. The debris could severely damage our satellites and endanger any astronauts aboard the International Space Station. And if any larger chunks of the asteroid found their way down to Earth, they could create craters up to 20 times their size. On the bright side, if the nuke exploded close enough to Earth, the radiation it emits would be distorted by our planet's magnetic field, which would probably be the prettiest light show you'd ever see. Or if you don't want to wait for a doomsday scenario, you could just take a trip up north to see the northern lights. It's crazy to think that nuking asteroids is a potential survival plan for humanity, but considering it's us against, well, pretty much anything in the infinite void of space, we have to make do with what we have.
volcanoes, the ultimate natural force of destruction. They're unforgiving, uncompromising, and unstoppable. About 1,500 volcanoes around the world are considered to be active, with more than 10% of them in the United States. Is there any way we could stop them before the destruction begins? Could we literally fight fire with fire? What if we nuked an active volcano? Would it solve the problem? Or make it way worse? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we nuked an active volcano. Volcanoes are as cool as they are terrifying. They are an incredible force of nature, capable of destroying our lives on their path of destruction. But could we give them a taste of their own medicine? How could we nuke such a fiery inferno? Well, we'd need to bring out the big guns. The nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan during World War II was the equivalent of over 130 million kilograms of TNT. That had plenty of impact. Could we use something like it to blow a volcano to smithereens? First, we'd have to figure out the target. While it's difficult to predict when a volcano will erupt, there are some warning signs. Watch for things like tiny earthquakes, releases of steam and other gases from the volcano's mouth and bulging from the sides. Sounds like my last date. That being said, whether the volcano will erupt is still a massive educated guess. So let's say that our scientists locked on to an active volcano that's ready to blow. It would be a miracle if they could coordinate with the military fast enough to try and stop it. Ideally, we'd be able to predict it a few days before the volcano was about to explode. This would provide more than enough time for people to pack up their belongings and evacuate without causing the kinds of highway traffic jams we see during hurricanes, tsunamis, and other disasters. With everyone out of harm's way, geologists, volcanoologists, and weapons experts would determine any weak spots on a volcano's sides that could be hit effectively. Next, a highly trained crew of pilots would fly over the volcano, drop their payload, and get the heck out of Dodge. If things worked perfectly, as in if they used the exact right amount of explosives and hit the perfect spot in exactly the right way, the top of the volcano would crumble into itself, keeping the magma mostly underground. There might still be some seepage around the base of the volcano, but it wouldn't be anything like how the eruption would have played out naturally. But if we're being honest, it would be like trying to put out fire with gasoline. Geologists warn that trying to bomb a volcano might actually make things worse, a lot worse. The explosion of the bomb mixed with the buildup of pressure inside a volcano could amplify the eruption. The force would release even more ash and lava, spreading it even further than it would have gone with the volcano's own power. And that's if we managed to hit the target. If the nuke missed its target, there's still a nuclear bomb being dropped in an area where people live, or at least near enough that they would feel the effects of the radiation. If you had to pick one, which would you choose? Death by lava or nuclear destruction? We can't bomb our way out of this problem, the same way we can't stop magma from building up under volcanoes. Here at What If, we've tried throwing trash and pouring liquid nitrogen into volcanoes. Long story short, it doesn't work. Don't mess with volcanoes. As cool as it sounds on paper, nuking a volcano just won't work. While man-made firepower can be impressive, nature isn't quaking in its boots at what we can do. But since our trigger fingers are itchy, what if we tried combating another natural disaster with a nuke? What if we nuked a hurricane? Well, that's a story for another What If.
Jupiter may be the biggest planet in the solar system, but its day 